Open your Bibles with, you, with me to Matthew chapter 3. We're going to go through 13 through 17. This is a, possibly a familiar passage to many of you guys. What I want to tell you this morning is that we serve a God that is three in one. And I feel like there's all kinds of fantastic scriptures uh, throughout the Bible that kind of highlight this all the way from Genesis forward. But Matthew, it's just one of those uh, undeniable passages where it really highlights the three distinct persons of the Godhead. And we're going to get into why this is important and what it means to you here in a moment. But why don't you stand with me one last time, get those legs stretched as we jump into Matthew chapter 3 and verse 13. It says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. And John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me? And Jesus replied, and he said, Let it be so. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. When John consented, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, now notice the Trinity here. We see Jesus, he's the dude in the water. He says, at that moment, the heavens opened and we saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. That's the Holy Spirit alighting on him. And then a voice from heaven. This is God the Father saying, this is my Son in whom I am well Please. Now, Holy Spirit, what I need you to do this morning is I need you to be able to minister in a way that I could never minister on my own, Lord God, because where men's words can carry into their ears and pierce the heart, Lord God, your spirit goes so much deeper. It goes into the innermost part of our being, and it brings revelation, not just of the truth, Lord God, but the true truth of your word, the revelation of who you are. And as we see you, God, the more that we see you, the more that we love you, the more that we know you, the more that we want to know about you. We could never exhaust the, exa- the depths of who you are. So come and speak, Lord, your servants. We're listening this morning. We are listening. Amen and amen. So you guys may be seated. You got Jesus being baptized. You got God the Father saying, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And the Holy Spirit is bringing that connection between heaven and earth there as he descends down upon Jesus. And the skeptic says, who cares? (laughs) We were talking to some people this week and they're like, you know, people just don't know like some of the basics of faith. And I really feel like that's been the heart of some of the series. Like who cares? It means the world because if you're going to go live a life that invites others to embrace Jesus, there's going to be times where you connect with people that are Muslims, people that are Jewish, people that are Mormons or Jehovah Witnesses. And when you talk to them on the front end, they'll be like, oh yeah, I believe in God. In fact, if you ever get one of those little knocks on the door and they got the white t-shirt on and they, you know, with their little tie and everything, that's part of the way they get their foot in the door. You believe in God? I believe in God too. You talk about Jesus? We have Jesus in our book too. You know, that kind of thing. And it's the exact same way that Satan deterred Eve in the garden. With the simple words, did God really say this? If you don't know the word, if you don't know the God that you serve, then you're really susceptible to whatever the opinion and the thoughts of another man are. If you don't know who this God is, if I go back to my infamous clay, we're going to auction these off at the end of this series because I know you guys have just really been wanting them for your mantle or something like that. If you don't know this God, which is supposed to represent the Bible, if you don't know the God of the Bible, then this God is a possibility in each and every one of our lives. Whatever it looks like. Maybe you turn it that way. Maybe you got this. Maybe yours has a little bit funnier bunny ears or something like that. The point is, is that when you don't know the God of the word, then when anybody else, especially if they come in and they're very articulate, they can kind of persuade you one way or the other. And so when we look at the Trinity, uh, chances are that you've heard about God the Father and his love for us, that even though we sinned, it said that he loved us so much that as our judge, he had the ability just to say, boom, you're done. But he said, no, I'm going to send my son to be the savior. And so we talk about God the Father. We talk about God the Son who's come and he's been a redemption for us. And he paid a price that we could never pay. He lived on this earth for 33 years, completely sinless, gave his life over for us, raised from the dead, is now sitting at the right hand of the Father and he's interceding for us with the promise that he's going to return for his spotless bride. And so we've talked about Jesus and we will continue to talk about Jesus and the Father. But what I really want to focus on, not just this week, but also next week, as Pastor Dale is going to be uh, ministering with me, um, we're going to be talking specifically about the Holy Spirit. When was the last time you heard a good message that just kind of leaned into the Holy Spirit? I love talking about the three distinct persons of the Godhead because not only does it help me articulate what I believe to others, 
which is important because we don't want to be ignorant Christians. <laughs> but also, it helps me worship God on a whole different level. You ever notice that like with your spouse, the more that you get to know them, the easier it is to convey your love to them. It's not that like I didn't love you before then, but it's just now I can actually show you how much more I love you. In fact, Lauren took it upon herself to go uh, the extra mile this past week with my birthday. And she just, you know, tried to do anything and everything that she's ever thought that I've enjoyed in life. So we saw movies, we ate so much food, I couldn't hardly see straight. Uh, We saw some friends, like just did all kinds of great things. She really killed it. Uh, But it's because she's taken the time to get to know me that she knows how to convey how much she loves and appreciates me. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. But also for God, when I get to know his three distinct persons here, I can look at God the Father and say, Lord, I recognize the sin and who I have been in the past. And I recognize that I am not deserving of the love that you give and yet you freely give it. I can connect with Jesus on a personal way because the Bible says, we read it last week, it says that he is not indifferent to the struggles that we experience because he came to this earth as a man in such a way just to show us like, hey, I've been through it too. I know what you're going through right now. I get it. The Bible says that he was tempted in every way. So I can connect with Jesus on a personal level. Thank you for going through that process, for paying the price that I could have never paid. But then when I connect with the Holy Spirit, it's on this whole next level where, God, you're not just there out there in the clouds and you haven't just taken care of me in the past, but you've come alongside me. And so what I want to talk to you about this morning is how to connect with the Holy Spirit and just first talk about who is the Holy Spirit. And to preface this, I want you to go into John 14, verses 16 and 17. We're going to hang in these few chapters here between John 14 and we'll go out to 16 a little bit. But what's happening here is Jesus is about, most scholars believe that we're in the last 12 to 14 hours of his time with his disciples before he's about to surrender his life over to be crucified upon a cross. And so he's talking to these disciples and get yourself in the picture here. For the last three years, these guys have seen amazing signs and wonders. And really, in a lot of ways, I feel like their life has been on autopilot. It's just like, which way do we go? You know, you're just following him. Okay, he's right there. Oh, he's going over this way now. In fact, anytime they lost him, they kind of freaked out because it's like, where'd he go? You know, that kind of thing because they were so used to just having him right there. And so he's telling him, I'm not going to be with you much longer. And so they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. We've gone this far now. We've laid it all down. What's going to happen? And so in John 14, 16 and 17, this is how he says it. He says, I'm not going to be with you much longer, but I will pray to the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. So Jesus was intentional in the amount of time that he was there on earth in that physical being. But he says, another helper is going to come that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth who the world cannot receive because it it neither sees him nor it knows him. But you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. So God sends Jesus for the salvation of our soul. And then Jesus sends the Holy Spirit to come and abide with us. And if you notice, because our culture is all about some personal pronouns right now, right? At no time did Jesus ever address the Holy Spirit as an it or a thing. He never said, I'm going to give you, you know, he was a carpenter. He's like, I didn't whittle out 12 little crosses or little Jesus fish that you could hold on to and remember me by, you know, pass it down from one generation to the next and tell the stories of the things that you saw. He didn't give some inanimate object. What he said is, I'm going to send you another helper. I've been your helper here in person, but we're going to take it another level now. And five different times he addresses he, him, 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 he. He just keeps going back to this is someone that you can have a personal relationship with with, because I want to tell you again, we say the core value here at the gathering is relationship, and we say the kingdom of heaven is more about a relationship than it is about theology. If it was just all about the thinking and the process and remembering, Jesus would have just came over there and gave him a bunch of books and said, hey, study these, memorize these, these will work it out, this is your theology, this is everything you need to know from now until I return again. But that's not what he did. He said, I'm going to send you a helper. I'm going to send you something personal. Something relational. And so what I want to tell you first and foremost is that the Holy Spirit is a person. It's a personal being that wants to connect with you in a very real and a personal way. It's not designed to be some piece of clay that just makes sense in your own brain. But he's saying, I want to give you something supernatural. The second thing you got to know is, is that he is essential. 
We're going to look at this a little bit closer here in a minute, but in John 16, 7 through 11, I just want to look at chapter, or verse 7 here real quick. He says, Very truly I tell you, it's good that I'm going away, because unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. Let me read that again, because I read over it maybe five or six times, and the Spirit just kept bringing me back to it. He's like, you didn't catch it. Read it again. Let me give you it one more time. John 16, 7, he says, Very truly I tell you, it's good that I'm going away. Put it in context here. Jesus is saying we've had this one-on-one connection for the last three years, but it's good that I go away because unless I go away, the advocate will not come unto you. He's saying the Holy Spirit's gonna come and what he's gonna do, he's gonna take the relationship to a level that you have not gotten to experience with Jesus in front of you. As I started studying it, some guys actually challenged it this way. They said, if you could put it in context, Since there was no sin in Jesus' life, he would never have died. He would still be alive today because the wages of sin is death. He had no sin in his life, so there would not have been death unless he took our sin upon upon himself so that he would die. So he could have continued to be on. He could have had his own YouTube channel. He could have been on Daystar at like primetime slot, you know, Sunday with Jesus, you know, from (laughs) 12 to 1 o'clock kind of thing. But he's saying... It's good that I go away. It's good that you no longer see this physical man standing in front of you because the advocate, the Holy Spirit is coming. And we could unpack this and it would take weeks upon weeks and maybe we will sometime. I don't really feel the release to do that yet. But just one simple thought, you know, when Jesus was ministering, we have more than 12 people here, thank God. But if I'm ministering to one, that means the 11 have to wait. If we're gonna do one-on-one time with Jesus, The one has to wait. Or he can address the group in mass, but if he's going to direct a personal issue that you're going through, then he can spend time with you, but I can't spend time with you at the same time I'm doing with you. It's important to understand that the the word that the Spirit uses, and this is going to be bad Texanese, but parakletos, if we can use that, paraklete, however you want to say it, when you break up the word for Holy Spirit there in the Hebrew, it's two words, para, meaning alongside, and kletos, to come along. So the Holy Spirit's purpose, the reason why, one of the main reasons why it's important that Jesus go so the Holy Spirit can come is now no longer do you just have to be isolated to this man that we can see from a distance, but now you have the Holy Spirit that's coming right alongside you. And so as God is ministering to you, he's able to minister to you. He's able to connect with you at the same time that he's connecting with you and you. And all around, we go right back to what we talked about last week where he is omnipresent. He is everywhere, all at the exact same time. And so Jesus is saying, we're going to take this to a whole nother level. If you actually look at the sphere and the area that Jesus got to minister over those three years, it was quite small. And he understands this gospel is not just for this small little region right here. Can I tell you the vision that God has for Prosper and for the gathering? It's bigger than just our little city, our town. They don't like to be called a city. Our town of 30,000 some odd people. It's going to extend even beyond the DFW Metroplex. We're already giving into those things, but I believe we are going to be sending hands and feet out around the world to be connecting with people. And it's through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus is saying, Holy Spirit is essential that it's good that I was here, but it's even going to be taking you to another level whenever I go and the Holy Spirit comes to connect. So then the question is, okay, so what's he going to do? If you're saying this is better, what do we have? I want to just look over at the Apostle Paul real quick in Acts 19. I love his enthusiasm in this and make it personal. Imagine Paul is talking to you here in Acts 19, just looking at verse 1, and then we're going to get right back into John. But Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus, and there he found some disciples. So he didn't go to Ephesus, he came to Prosper. And there he found a little startup church in a school, and he found some people and he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? When that, when that pastor gave you the altar call and you came forward and did the whole like repenting of the sins and you confessed with your mouth and believed in your heart that Jesus is Lord, did you receive the Holy Spirit? And they said, nope, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Guys, don't believe that the church is too far removed from men just like this. That there are people that have spent years in church and they're like, we don't know anything about this. We talk about, you know, five good ways to not get fat in the holidays or something like that at church and talk about, you know, self-control or whatever, but we haven't heard nothing about a Holy Spirit. Did you receive him when you believed? And they answered, no, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? And they said, well, we received John's baptism. 
They replied, and Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He's saying, you got, you, got, you got your heart in the right place. You accepted Christ as your Lord. You went down there in the water, symbolizing that you were dying unto yourself, and you were raised anew in Christ. He said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him. So Paul is literally quoting what Jesus was talking about to his disciples, right? He said, I'm, there's going to be one that's coming after me that's going to be with you forever. He's saying, Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him. That is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. On the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, we saw a lot of different things happen. There was fire that fell down. There was evangelism that took place. There was salvations. There was prophecy. All the things that we saw in the Old Testament moving forward into, into Jesus' ministry, the one distinguishing thing that you see whenever Paul lays hands on the people and it says that they received the Holy Spirit is, is that they spoke in tongues. That was the one unique thing. In Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, the thing that was unique in that moment is that they spoke in tongues. But let me tell you, I say this often, do you have to pray in tongues to go to heaven? Absolutely not. There was no record of Jesus looking over at the, uh, at the thief on the cross next to him and he prayed for him. He said, okay, now you need to get baptized and then you need to go pray in tongues before you can actually be in there with me. He just accepted Christ as Lord and he said, you know, from this point forward, you're gonna spend eternity with me. So this isn't a heaven or hell issue but, you know, you don't have to have a vehicle to get around DFW. You could walk, but why would you want to? <laughs> you can go further with less effort when you got a car. And I can tell you, in your Christian walk, you will go further with less effort when you have that ability to speak in an unknown language to you. So Paul, Paul, Paul lay hands on these men. They received the Holy Spirit. So what does he do? He's a helper. Plain and simple, he's a helper. Let me go right back to John uh, and look at chapter 16. He says, truly I tell you, it is good for you that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come. And now he's gonna break it down a little bit more. He says, but if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world to be wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. If I could make it maybe a little too simple in some ways, what he's saying is he's gonna make that salvation personal. When it talks about him uh, proving the world uh, wrong about sin, he's going to show you that you're a sinner. He's going to reveal that to you because we can look at our lives apart from Christ and say, everything that I'm doing is right by the world's standards. There's nothing that the government says that I'm doing wrong and my sphere of influence is totally okay with the life that I live. But what does it look like when you compare your life to the word of God? A lot of times people find righteousness in their own eyes, but we are not the standard. I joke around sometimes and I say, I do not punish my kids based on the things that they do that I've never done. Because if that was the case, they would never be corrected because I was crazy as a child. In fact, it's kind of humbling when I see one of my kids do something that I'm like, man, I know they picked that up off of me. But the correction comes because I'm not setting myself as the standard. I'm setting the standard to be the word of God. And so the Holy Spirit comes to reveal that sin to you. What you're gonna notice as you walk with the Lord and go deeper with him is that he's gonna start putting his hand on different areas of your life. And you're gonna say, you know, the world doesn't have a problem with me doing this. But for some reason, every time I do it, I just feel some kind of prick inside me that says, ooh, I shouldn't do that right now. I really don't need, but everybody else is doing it, and I don't see anyone. You can't show me in the Bible where it's wrong. I get that, but the Holy Spirit's saying, hey, I just want that out of your life. Because he sees the beginning from the end, and he knows where it's going to lead, and he's trying to get you out of the way of a lot of problems. Can I tell you, the Holy Spirit wants to reveal the sin that's in your life. He wants to reveal that the sin that you had in your life has already been paid for through the cross in Christ Jesus. He says, you re he reveals that we need a savior in verse 10 about righteousness because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. That Jesus is going there and he is interceding on our behalf. So every time Satan tries to bring accusation, Jesus can stand there and say, I've already paid the price for it. It doesn't need to be paid again. He's covering each and every sin. And then he brings this peace that's found at the heart of knowing that we have the victory. The lie of the enemy is always, you're not going to make it. I've got you on this one. But what he knows that he doesn't want you to know is that he has already been defeated. 
And the Holy Spirit comes to bring that into, remind, into remembrance. What it says there in John 12, 31, it says, now is the time for judgment of this world and the prince of this peace has been driven out. The lie is that you're a sinner and that God's gonna get you. And he's gonna find out what you're doing. Who do you think you are trying to come to church on a Sunday morning? Who do you think you are connecting with him every single day? You know he has a problem with what you're doing right there. I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I've been washed in his blood. I'm no longer a slave to that sin, but I'm his child. I find my identity in him. The second thing you need to know about the Holy Spirit is simply this. He's my friend and he is not weird. I'm appreciative of social media because I hung around with a lot of weird dudes in high school. Most of them like to use medicinal substances for ailments that they did not have. There was a lot of glaucoma uh, in my school <laughs> based on the medicines that were being used. Uh, they were weird whether they were on those substances or not. They were a little extra weird when I got on those substances. Um, I've seen in past years now on social media, a lot of these guys have uh, made this transition. They started following Christ. And I can't help but think, you know, you were weird before you met Jesus. You're probably still weird even after you met Jesus. And I think a lot of times we see a weird person and we just associate them with Christianity. Or we say, well, if that person's weird, then God's got to be weird. But it makes no, there's no correlation there. They were just a weird person. Before they ever met God, they were weird. I have a friend who is a diehard fan of the Houston Texans. I know Lucas and I don't, don't believe in this. He's a diehard fan. I'm not talking like he has, you know, the little Toro thing on the back of his truck. He has that, but he goes to every home game there in Houston. He wears the luchador mask and a sombrero. He's got like the little bullet strap things around his chest with the two machetes and he's wearing the full outfit. I mean, he's the guy that when they do the little B-roll cutaway scene before the commercials, a lot of times you will actually see his person like on the screen right there. He's in the calendar with the Houston. T the brother is weird. Like, it's like when he puts the thing on, he's a totally different person. Nine to five, Monday through Friday, he's like an IT guy that is just as normal as any other dude. But when he gets that outfit on, it goes nuts. I would never look at the Houston Texans and say, well, they got to be weird because that's one of their fans. But how many times do we sit there and dismiss the work of the Holy Spirit or God as a whole because we see a weird person and just say, oh, well, that guy says that he's a fan of Christ. And so God's got to be weird because that dude's completely lost. Now, I'm just telling you, sometimes people are just weird and that has nothing to do with God. A lot of times Satan wants to bring attention to those people in your life because if he can get you to mock the things of the Spirit, then it hinders your ability to receive what God wants to have for your life. There's a lot of times like the expressions of worship. You know, we're all relatively calm to some degree, but there's some that like really like to get after it, you know, when it comes time for praise and worship. And there's a propensity inside each and every one of us to be like, whoo, what's wrong with that guy? But at the same time, it's like, dude, that makes sense in some ways. When you're connecting with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, like it might be even a little bit more weird to just be like, like, what am I doing? I'm just kind of like laying out here doing something. But I don't know, to each their own, I'm not trying to judge it. But I'm just saying, be open to whatever it is that God has. Don't dismiss something just because you see somebody that's weird connecting with it. Be open to whatever it is the Holy Spirit has. I want to show you the gifts of the Spirit. He doesn't make you weird. He actually makes you powerful. Galatians 5.22, I've heard some of you guys actually quote this a couple times. It's a powerful thing, and it's what you know that you can hold on to. The markers in your life, you say, do I have the Holy Spirit active in my life? He said, well, there's an easy way to find out. Do you find these things evident in your daily walk with the Lord? The fruit of the Spirit is, come on, you know it, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Nine key elements. If you're asking, do I have this right now? Maybe when I'm at my best, you know, maybe not on your lowest day, you're not like really feeling it. Bring it back up there for me, Matt. We talked about love at the beginning of the series and said that God is love, that not everything that the world calls love is God, but God is love. It's an unhindered love. It's an unselfish love. It's a love that gives even whenever we know we won't get anything in return. The Holy Spirit is the only one that can enable you to give that kind of love, to just give with open hands and an open heart. Joy. Notice it doesn't say happiness. You've probably heard this before. The pursuit of happiness is never a pursuit that's meant to be accomplished. It's just a lifelong journey of ups and downs and the hope that I'm gonna get close and ooh, the closer I get, the happier I am and then the further it is, ooh, those are hard days for me. That's not what the Holy Spirit brings, that he empowers you to live a life 
of joy. That joy is not based on circumstances, it's based on your identity in Christ. And the Holy Spirit comes alongside you and he reminds you of that joy. This is a huge one right here. Peace. Huge. <laughs> it's huge. Peace. Oh, the name of, of God is Jehovah Shalom. He is the peace that goes beyond understanding. We say it like this. He's peace that goes beyond your circumstance. What the world has to offer is you say, you know, it, it was like a, what Ray said last week, the win-then mentality. When I have this, then I will do this. When I have this, when I've seen this prayer answered, when this person does what we're praying for, then we will have peace and we can like be at rest or we can focus on the next thing. And that's the happiness. But the peace that the Holy Spirit brings goes way beyond whatever's going on around you. It's an internal peace that says, even in the midst of the storm, still I will trust you. Even in the midst of the storm, I will obey. It's not when then, it's God, here I am, send me. In every circumstance, in every walk of life, it doesn't matter what I'm seeing around me because I don't live by sight, but I live by the word of the Lord. He brings peace. He brings patience. Ooh, I need more of this in my life. I, uh, I posted a quote on the gram this week and it just said, you know, if Satan can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. It was, uh, I can't remember who, who actually coined the phrase, but it's 100% truth in your life that if he can't make you sin, he'll just make you busy. I mean, no, you're not you whenever you're impatient. When I tell Lauren that we need to leave at 1145 so that we can get to our friend's house and we leave at 1153, the patience is waning at that moment. And I'm not showing the love of God like I should. I am not at peace in the way that I should. And so all Satan has to do is just get you into this mindset. Lauren was talking to somebody the other day and they're like, we have these things with our kids and like on Mondays and Tuesdays, they're doing this. And then Wednesdays and Thursdays, they're doing this. And then Friday, Saturday and Sunday, they're doing this. There's literally no break at all. We're just constantly going. We just got to get busy. We got to get something done because what are our kids going to think? What are our spouses going to think? What are people around us going to think if they just see us resting? That can't be a good thing, right? And yet the command is you have to have a day of rest. It was one of the top tens when Jesus said, hey, we got a lot of other stuff that we're going to talk about, but let's just lay the foundation right here. Within the top 10 commandments right here, day of rest, Sabbath. I can't be at peace when I don't have the Holy Spirit. I'm just constant. I got to be pushing. There's no peace when you have the Holy Spirit. It's not about, do I have enough for today? It's like, even if I have enough for today, what about tomorrow? Have you even thought about next year? You don't know how that's gonna look. What about when the kids go to this and whenever I gotta go? No peace. The Holy Spirit comes and brings peace that passes all understanding. When you have that peace, then you move in a heart of patience. I'm kinder to the people around me when I have that peace and when I have that patience. There's goodness that can flow out of me. I'm faithful to that which God has called me to do because I'm not sidetracked by the busyness of life. I'm gentle, I have self-control. And basically what it comes down to, guys, if the Holy Spirit's giving it, whether it's tongues, whether it's this whole list of nine different things, my heart posture is I want it. I connect with a guy at least once a week. Uh, we did it all last year, and then we got into the Christmas time, and both of our schedules got busy, and then we turned the corner into this year, and like we would connect two or three times over the phone and be like, man, my schedule's just not working out, and then he would have something, and it wouldn't work out. And we had missed, like, almost, well, it's almost been three months now of us not getting together, and it's like, but I keep pushing for those connections because I know whenever I get together with this guy, he pours life into me, he inspires me. He gives me new ideas. He challenges me in different ways. I say, this is something important in my life, so I'm going to keep pressing for it. Even if I keep getting shot down all of January, all of February, we're halfway through March, I'm still pushing for it. He's still pushing for it. We're going to connect together, guaranteed. We're going to get back into this routine because there's life that happens. How much so whenever we connect with the Holy Spirit? How much greater whenever we connect with God our Father? that it's worth the pursuit. You'll hear people talk and it's like, well, have you, have you done this? Yeah, I've tried it. Yeah, but did you stop? Well, yeah. The word said that when you seek and you find and the connotation there within that scripture, when it says you knock, it's just a constant. Until I hear it. My kids know how to do this. They were doing it at Brandon's house yesterday. I think they rang that poor guy's doorbell like three or four times. Like just for the, I'm like, what are you doing? They're just keeping, they're persistent. There's a persistence because I want to get all that the Holy Spirit has for my life. 
If you're giving it, God, I want it. I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit, he's come to be a helper. He's not weird. He's come to give you power. And the last one is he's just come to simply reveal that he is my God. He's come alongside of me. This is not the big guy upstairs. It's not Jesus is my homeboy. It is my God, it is my king, it is my Lord, it is my master, it is my redeemer, it is my friend. It's the one that sticks closer than a brother, but he's all in all. He's the rock, the thing that I stand on. He's the light into my path. He gives me direction. He gives me hope. He empowers me. He's everything that I need. All that is just words until you've connected with the Holy Spirit and he's revealed that power in your life. I want to just show you one more verse. And if you'll stand to your feet with me as we close out. John 14 and 26. The Holy Spirit teaches me and he reminds me. If I can say it like this in context of what the word's been teaching us this year, the Holy Spirit helps me to return and rebuild the relationship that I have with God. In John 14 and 26, it says, The advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things catch that word all? Not just I'll teach you a couple good things. He'll teach you all things. He will teach you how to be the spouse that you need to be for the person that you love. He'll teach you how to raise your kids. He'll teach you how to run that business that you have. He'll teach you how to speak to that person that you're like, I know that that person needs Jesus. I just don't know how to do it. He'll teach you and then he'll remind you of everything that Jesus has said. Any good parent knows that if you say it once, if you say it a dozen times, those kids still don't get it. They need constant reminders. Lauren will acknowledge the fact that she can't just say something to me. I'm still, <laughs> still got that childlike heart that needs a continual reminder about the things that need to be done. I can't do it on my own. Guys, I want to encourage you, stop trying to do things on your own. Partner with the Holy Spirit. Receive that love, that joy, that peace, that patience, that gentleness, that kindness, that faithfulness, that self-control. It's yours to be had and the Holy Spirit wants to come alongside you and help you do it. I feel like a lot of us are doing work on our own that we were never designed to do on our own. And you can see it in the faces of people. I feel like sometimes we're tired and we're not tired just because we lost an hour of sleep. I wish they would stop doing the hours, changing around, like just let us work in the dark or whatever we got to do. You know? But it's not just an hour of sleep that's causing us to be tired. It's that we have been fighting on our own. We reject the word of the Lord in our lives and we say, no, I'm going to get it on my own. I'm going to do things my way because I just like being in control. But if I could just challenge you this morning, the word of God says, cast all of your cares upon him. The heaviness, the things that steal your sleep in the middle of the night, cast all your cares upon him. And when you do that, what he gives you in return is peace. But even more than just peace, he gives you direction so that you're not just fighting constantly against a wall that never seems to move, but you're moving forward into the things and the purpose that God has for your life. Stop fighting alone. Find rest, find peace, find joy, find patience as you connect with the Holy Spirit. Come on, let's pray this morning. Holy Spirit, I just invite you to take what has been spoken, what's been declared through your word. I invite you to take that now and bury it deep into the hearts of each and every one of us, certainly myself included. God, give us the opportunity to connect with you each and every day. Holy Spirit, we want to see that fruit evident in our life. This week, we want to see peace. This week, I want to see joy. Come on, I just speak it over your life right now. That as the Lord blesses you and keeps you and makes his face to shine upon you, that he be gracious unto you and he give you rest that he pours forth his goodness over your life. And the goodness that you obtain from him, you don't hold it for yourself, but you give it to others. That the love that you get from the Father, that you don't hold it to yourself, but you are given it in good measure so that you can pour out into those around you. That you live a life of joy. Come on, not just happiness that moves back and forth based on what work looks like or what the family life is looking like, but a joy that is found square in the heart of Christ. Jesus, give us your joy. Give us your hope. Give us your peace. We need you today, Lord God, and we love you so very much. Bless my friends now as we go out and we serve you. Help us to live a life that invites others to embrace you, Lord God, to give all that we have unto you because we love you. Amen, amen, and amen. <laughs>